I think there's something that the reading from Deuteronomy and the gospel reading have in common today. Deuteronomy 11.28, Moses says to the people, and a curse, I will bless you, I will lay upon you a blessing if you obey the commandments, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I commanded you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. There's a blessing if you follow God, and there's a curse if you don't. But he specifies the sin of idolatry if you turn aside after other gods that you have not known. Now, I think it would be easy for us to think, to be too literal here, and to think that as long as the Jews did not commit idolatry, they were fine. But I think not only is idolatry an example of a heinous sin or a very serious sin, but in a way it contains all the other sins. Anytime you put something above God, you are taking, anytime you sin, you are taking a lesser good and making it a greater good. You are disordinate. You are out of order. And so if you think that money is more important than being kind or being honest, you are turning money into an idol. If you think that food is more important than your health or than the gifts that God has given you in your body when you eat trash, well, that's a form of idolatry. You're turning food into something greater than it is. So, in a way, if you look at this not just literally, he's not just saying you will be cursed if you practice idolatry and start to worship false gods, because all sin, and the Old Testament points this out elsewhere, including in the Book of Wisdom, all sin is a form of idolatry, of disordinate love. Now, when you look at the Gospel reading, this is Jesus talking about, again, in a way, the end times. We had gotten out of that, and then he gave us a couple parables, maybe more than a couple, maybe even the parable of the talents, for instance, was about when the master returns to seek whatever fruits his servants have produced with what he's given them, maybe even the talents, the parable of the talents is about the end times. Certainly this one is in a way that seems to be quite literal. The sheep and the goats being separated at the end of time. Those who have served God in others, who have helped the sick and the naked and the hungry and the forlorn and so forth, those are the ones who make the kingdom. And the ones who haven't done that are sent away into everlasting fire. It's a parable of the end times. And all these end times stories and parables and descriptions come right before the passion begins. So that's interesting that Jesus talks about the end of things right before his own personal end of things, the end of things of his earthly ministry. But again, I think you might be, you have to take what Jesus is saying and not be just literal. But by the same token, you have to remember that what he's saying is literally, he's, he's being literal in a story that has a greater point. He's not saying, blessed are you who have worshipped me in a certain way liturgically. Blessed are you who only have gone to the Latin Mass. Blessed are you who have only worn veils while in the uh, uh, church. Blessed are you who fill in the blank, which might be genuine expressions of devotion. Blessed are you who have prayed novenas. Enter into my kingdom. He's not saying that. He's saying, how have you treated others? Because remember, there are two major commandments that Jesus sums up all of the Jewish law, all of the Ten Commandments, all of the Mosaic law, with love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He takes that from the Old Testament and he says, this is what it's all about. And so the people who are loving toward their neighbors and who see God in their neighbors, who see all humanity as being made in the image and likeness of God, these are the people who are saved, quote unquote, in this parable. And the others who are contemptuous of their neighbors are condemned in this parable. But I think in this, it's a similar thing that's going on in Deuteronomy. If all sin is a form of idolatry, so all love must be expressed ultimately in love of other people. 
G.K. Chesterton says we're told to love our neighbors and to love our enemies, probably because they're the same person. If your neighbor drives you crazy and is your enemy, well, it's hard to love other people. Have you noticed that? I've noticed that. But in a way, if you're doing that, it can be assumed that you're not disordinate. You're not practicing a kind of idolatry where you're majoring in minors or putting small things where big ones should go. Jesus is saying what it all comes down to is do you love me in your neighbor? Do you feed me, clothe me, visit me because I am in the suffering humanity around you? That encompasses, in a sense, all virtue. All virtue must either express itself as that or in a way be related to that. So that if you become proud of how you worship or proud that you're a Catholic and not a Protestant, though Protestants these days are probably born into it, proud that you're fill in the blank and not this, you're like the Pharisee, thank God that I'm not like that publican, that sinner over there, that tax collector who is beating his breast. Thank God that I'm special. Once you start doing that, that's pride, and that's a form of idolatry, and that's getting away from this self-emptying in love that we are called to offer, particularly in recognizing that all humanity, all humanity is made in the image and likeness of God. So that when, for instance, St. Teresa of Calcutta took in dying people and ministered to them and helped them, she did not ask them, are you Muslim? Are you Christian? Are you Hindu? She saw Jesus in them and cared for them. So that's what's really important. And that's the final parable of our Lord right before the Passion begins.